welcome and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. In this show, we cover a broad range of topics that both cater to CRE newcomers and industry leaders alike. I'm your host, Ashley Kopovich, Regional Director at Crexy a comprehensive digital commercial real estate platform designed to empower CRE real estate professionals with the tools they need to discover and transact property. Today, we are thrilled to discuss lessons learned from investing in commercial real estate and tech with Hunter Dallas of Leon Capital Group. Hunter Dallas serves as managing director for the private equity division at Leon Capital Group. With an emphasis on healthcare and technology, Hunter is responsible for sourcing platform acquisitions, transaction structuring, strategy execution at the broad level, and driving organic and inorganic growth within Leon Capital's portfolio companies. Prior to Leon Capital, Hunter was at Goldman Sachs in the real estate investing, the real estate financing group with the investment banking division. At Goldman, Hunter was involved in over 1.5 billion in debt financing emphasizing structured products in markets across the U.S. Prior to Goldman, Hunter worked at the Caterpillar Financing Group in their finance leadership development program and received a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics from Vanderbilt University. Hunter, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Ashley. Of course, very excited to get into what we're talking about today and thrilled to have you on. So with that said, let's dive in. So the first topic, Hunter, I want you to just walk us through how you initially got involved in commercial real estate and investing. Sure. Uh, So it was uh, a bit happenstance, but uh, I'd say when you graduate and and start working in the uh, financial crisis, you kind of adapt to to whatever makes sense. But I I had this very, you know, this pull towards working with something that I could look and see, see and touch. And, and so I gravitated towards you know, real estate. You know, I think that the tangible asset is what everyone says. And there, there is something about going out and, and meeting people and, and seeing where your investment is going and uh, lucked into a, a job at, at Goldman Sachs, um, specifically focused on you know, commercial mortgage-backed securities and, and really the origination of uh, debt product uh, focused on, on real estate assets. And so I got a lot of exposure very quickly from everything from you know, manufactured, manufactured housing on, on Huntington Beach, which was uh, pretty interesting. I didn't, you know, it was a uh, $4,000 a month rent, which seemed pretty expensive, but you got beachfront property to converted uh, Air Force bases and up in Marin County that was, um, you know, turned into some really cool office space. And so I, you know, I had a lot of, of you know, fun uh, in, in learning, you know, a lot of different um, credit perspective on real estate and kind of what, you know, what was desirable to buyers, what, you know, what we were looking for from a credit perspective to ensure that, you know, the, the capital that was being invested and then securitized was, was safe. And so it taught me a lot about real estate and, and structured products uh, in that endeavor. Got it. Well, well, thanks for that background. Um, I don't know if we can still get the same four thousand um, dollars on on the beachfront property <laughs> these, these days. Uh, maybe a shack on Venice Beach, but but we could definitely try. Um, so so that's awesome to hear. Um, and then and then you mentioned you know kind of the great financial crisis. Um, you know the two thousand eight crash. Um, so maybe what lessons did you learn either from that or just early on in your career? career that helped serve you, um, you know, for years to come throughout this next time in your, in your life? Sure. You know, I think, you know, one of the big takeaways I had separate from working in the crisis was, you know, I think everyone starts their career. It's very competitive. Everyone wants to be the best or do the best, or whatever the best means to you individually. But I think a lot of people think of that you know, area or time period of your career is kind of the zero sum game. And, and it's really not. And there was a, there was a partner that was speaking to us at Goldman and 
he really drove that message home for me in that the people around you, you're going to run into them, you know, throughout the next 20, 30, 40 years of your career. And you really, you know, those relationships are just, uh, you want to make sure that you're thinking about it over the long term. I think there's a, there's a huge impetus in just American capitalism to think about the next quarter or think about, you know, hitting, you know, the quota for the month and, and not thinking about how you get there and what that implication could have five, 10, 15 years from now. Um, you know, the, where I work now was a product of an early relationship. And so I think that that was probably the biggest takeaway is that I came into the job thinking, okay, I want to be the best, you know, at all costs. And, and then it really opened my eyes of the, what you gain from dealing with really smart people across the board and what they can mean for your career and, and just your professional uh, fulfillment and enrichment um, over that time period. That was probably the biggest takeaway from just starting off. And then, you know, working in the financial crisis, it was just, it was a very interesting time of what was happening at like a very micro level, like being able to see individual pieces of real estate and what was going on in that economy. And then that juxtaposition of what was going on in like the bond market and like how those things could have very different uh, tones to them. And so, you know, I think that is probably even more true now of what you're hearing in the media, what you're seeing at a local level and, and how people try to discern what is really going on is, is really difficult. But, you know, I think the fact that the idea that it's a new phenomenon is, is far from the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks. Thanks for that overview. Um, I gleaned two really important things just from what you said. Um, the first, I love when you say you want to be the best and whatever that means to you. Um, I absolutely love that. I haven't heard it put in those terms before, but you know, everyone wants to be the best. And I think that being competitive is, is really great. Um, but I think that being competitive within yourself, you know, be, be 1% better every single day, um, is really important. So I love that insight that you gave us there. Um, and the second one is really big too. Um, I just had a conversation with some younger peers that I, I mentor, and it's always about setting your brand, right? Even from the start of your career, especially in commercial real estate, which obviously we're in, it's a very relationship-driven business, right? So how you introduce yourself, how you carry yourself, your first impression can, you know, lead you into the next 10, 20, 30 years. Maybe it gets you another job opportunity or a project or, you know, a listing if we're from a broker perspective. So I also love that and, and think it's really important, especially, you know, throughout your entire career, but especially especially when you're starting out, I think. So thanks, yeah, for, thanks for sharing. Well, and, uh, and that's a good way to put it, your brand. I mean, as, as a, a kind of a finance-minded person, it probably took me 15 years to appreciate that comment and think about things in that, especially in this environment, there's so much about first impressions and the perception of you out there, good or bad. And what you do, it's, all, it's, a, it's a series of little decisions. And I think there's this, you know, overarching theme that everyone thinks that there's this moment of, of um, clairvoyance where someone makes a really good decision and then they create this big company and it's, and it's really just a compilation of small decisions, you know, staying true to your brand, building that over time. And that's, that's really where you see these, these great outcomes. I love that. It's small decisions. It's in your little habits every single day that's going to lead to that, to that success. Um, so Thanks for sharing that, Hunter. I appreciate it. Um, so moving on into our second topic. So for full disclosure to our listeners, you are an investor in Crexy. In fact, one of our earliest investors. So let's talk about that a little bit. So just give us maybe a 30,000 foot overview and share a little bit about, you know, your role in Crexy's origins for us. So it's probably some of my most fond memories of, of anything I've done professionally working with Mike and team early on. Um, I'll, I'll never forget my, my first phone call with, with Mike. And um, it was a very lively conversation. I was probably, you know, we were still inking the deal with them when I started. I was kind of, it was a new, you know, new language for me on the, on the venture side. And, uh, and I'll, I'll never, I'll, 
you know, maybe another podcast we can get into that call, but it was a fun one. And, uh, and since then, he's become a great friend and, uh, and really a leader in a, in a company that I really respect. And so I, my early uh, interactions, I mean, I, you know, I, the tech world was a bit new to me, you know, six, seven years ago in terms of like building a company in that type of, um, you know, disruptive environment, if you will, to be a bit cliche. And I remember showing up in, in Venice Beach and going to the house on Ocean, I think it was Ocean. And uh, I showed up in a suit, which was probably the biggest joke slash mistake that could have made and uh, you know everyone and that I just didn't I had no clue and it was so it was funny and I tried to ditch the sports code and and um, you know remember being in that little house trying to you know come up with um, the ideas of how we're going to take over the commercial real estate market from soup to nuts from investment sales to data and, and really everything in, in between and, uh, and it was started out as just, uh, you know, we, we try to build these models of how we think it'll play out. And, you know, you just admire people that, that are just so gritty and, and willing to, you know, kind of create something into an existence. And we would, uh, we would talk about, you know, what is, what is going to be a good benchmark for success? We're like, well, maybe if we can get to like a thousand listings or, or in, you know, uh, I think a very famous fantasy football team name of 500 OMs. And, and, and <laughs> we blew through those, um, we blew through those milestones, you know, almost overnight. It was just a very interesting phenomenon. And coming from my previous role, you know, it was very apparent that the segment needed technology and was, you know, itching for something to help streamline workflows to make things more efficient and, and so it was just very it was a very trial by fire out of the gates and you know some of the, the fondest memories I've had working with the business. That's awesome. That's wonderful to hear. Um, brings a huge smile to my face. Um, and also just a, a great story to hear how how much you were involved in in the starting of Crexy and um, probably also how much your prior career experience um, and knowledge you kind of brought with you. So I, I don't how, know if I'd say, you know, I, <laughs> those, those guys, you know, had it, they were just brilliant on the uh, on the real estate side. And so I, I viewed myself more as, uh, you know, random psychiatrist from time to time to helping, you know, put their thoughts in the numbers, but they, they really launched the idea. And I was just lucky to really, you know, be a small part of that, that early, early phase of the business. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I love the psychiatrist line. Sometimes we all need that um, professionally or we lean on friends. So um, thanks for coming in and doing that and, and helping us launch because technology is definitely needed in commercial real estate um, to keep moving the industry forward. So thank you there. Um, so walk us through some of the early days um, as an investor or advisor in a brand new technology company. So what are some of the challenges? What are some of the rewarding parts? Uh, kind of tell us both sides. So starting at, at that phase, I mean, we our angle as an investor has always been we're not, you know, we're not probability investing. We're not placing, you know, 20 in investments and and you know, hoping you know a handful of them turn out well. We try to figure out where we might have some sort of um, asymmetry, and, and how can we be capital, but also use something else we're working on to to provide a launch pad for a business. And in Crexy, you know, we were early capital, and I believe the first four listings, you know, are the Leon Capital Group listed there. You know, I forget what the properties were, but they were some single tenant assets that we were going to take to market and. You know, we, I think we were their first four listings and then quickly, you know, four became, you know, four million and, and <laughs> the, the, it's all history in between there. But, you know, working, it's interesting. I've worked with some technology companies. I've worked with some healthcare companies. And early on, the, the issues, regardless of, of the underlying problem you're trying to solve, are very similar. A lot of it's just how do you, you know, how do you take this great idea, this big problem? and kind of find an entry point into 
um, solving it. And, and sometimes you might say, hey, the whole industry is broken and it needs technology. But if, if you take that broad brush approach, you're never going to get there. Like you really have to find a back door and like figure out kind of the biggest pain point and start to solve that kind of the parallel of a lot of small decisions to, to build a career. You know, I think early stage companies follow that of they need to tackle, you know, kind of um, big problems, but in a very acute way. And, and I think some of the big decisions that were made early in the company was, was largely around, you know, how do we monetize this? And, and, and the solution was we wait, we, we don't. And, and that was probably the toughest decision for the team to make when you're balancing fundraising and dilution and, and longer term viability of strategy. You know, that is not a real estate question in and of itself, but it, that, that way to pitch um, you know, an environment is, is really hard. It's, it's a huge leap of faith. I mean, it's, you know, I think a lot of marketplaces have developed that way, but, you know, six, seven years ago when you're, um, starting a company and, and prop tech now is you know on fire in terms of interest and, and capital raise but six seven years ago it was kind of fledgling in terms of people didn't really understand it you know there wasn't a, it would have had you know there's a tangible asset somewhere in the mix and so is it scalable because it's not just pure software it's a it's a certain kind of industry um, and how long will it take to crack it? I mean, you know, there were a lot of questions early on of how do you, you know, things have been done a certain way for so long and a lot of people benefit from a certain way of doing things, but the overall market doesn't see all the, all the deals. It's not an efficient you know, way to price. And theoretically, these you know, certain kinds of assets in real estate should probably trade more like bonds. And so how do you kind of help that you know, mature the, the industry and, and provide brokers and the different constituents tools to, to make better decisions. I like that. I like that. I'm sure, you know, there was definitely a little bit of a tug of war there, but appreciate you bringing in, you know, your experience and, um, you know, kind of knowledge to, to say, let's hold off, let's wait. Obviously, it has benefited, um, you know, tremendously. So that was, uh, I'm sure, not an easy decision, but one that was um, influenced by by your knowledge, which is great. Oh, I, I appreciate <laughs> that. I mean, I, I don't know who had the brilliant idea. You know, it's probably the team uh, of let's wait, let's be patient. Uh, but, you know, everyone wants to get that first that first um, notch on the board. And so it was definitely difficult for, especially the people in, in the business to say, no, no, let's delay that gratification. And, and you know, so in, in an effort to, to really make a change in the industry. And it was, they were totally right about all of that. Absolutely. Uh, there's an old saying that I'm sure you all know, good things come to those who wait. So I think that's a, a good example right there. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, awesome. Well, thanks for that. Um, let's move on to our third topic. So Hunter, as both a, a VC and a CRE investor, we'd love to learn more about your investment ethos. So are there certain primary investment sectors um, that you choose to, to invest in? Talk us a little bit about that. Sure. So, you know, I've been with Leon Capital about six or seven years now. And when we started, it, a lot of it was, you know, what do we want to invest in? You know, as a family office, we don't have a fund that tells us how we can invest, where we can invest, how long we can invest. And so it was a bit of a blessing and a curse. You know, you've got this ocean of ideas out there. You know, where do you pick your spot? And it became a bit more primal over time. You know, it was where... Where are the essential, you know, where are the essential categories that regardless of what happens, be it pandemic, be it geopolitical environment, you know, where would we be safe to blend capital over the next 10, 20, 30 plus years? And so we've gravitated towards, um, you know, housing and healthcare um, and, and kind of, you know, kind of plays off of those two different trees. And so real estate, obviously, you know, the housing component, we build a lot of multifamily, but, you know, you need to facilitate that supply chain. So 
items within the you know housing and um, complementary segments that that supply chain things like Crexy make a ton of sense because you're helping people you're you're increasing um, the velocity of a transaction which increases liquidity in the market which has a lot of you know virtuous effects along the way but we really can tie everything we do today back to those you know, kind of human essentials of, of housing and healthcare. You know, if you look at what's happened recently with things like Netflix and where people are spending their money, you know, there will always be a desire for entertainment. But if someone's, you know, deciding between their health and, and you know, where they live, um, they're going to they're gonna reallocate those dollars. And so how can we be more involved in those, those segments are, are probably our two of our guiding principles. But then also, um, you know, what are what are some trends that will play on the margin? You know, the banking system, the real estate system. Um, we invested in a, in a neo bank recently because if you just look at the cost structure of, of you know, brick and mortar banks, I mean, it's very expensive to run a bank branch, and you know you may or may not be getting the best product to the customers who need it. And so there's been a lot of interest in, in that space. You know we. We tried our hand and, and have been um, in the cryptocurrency segment. It, like all of these are kind of themes of, uh, you know, people, their needs, their desires, what's going on um, in, you know, kind of bigger picture. And so how do we play those different themes? And we'll allocate a bit of our portfolio to, to those kind of more thematic items. But I'd say, you know, 80% of our portfolio these days falls into what we deem is like a very essential approach to, to life and investing. So it sounds yeah, pretty simple, but there's obviously a lot of different ways you can, you can spend a, a lifetime in those two segments. Of course, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, the, the essentiality of everything is it just makes total sense, um, especially the way that you explain it. Um, I was actually curious to, to hear your thoughts on, you know, investing in crypto or, or things like that. One of the things for our listeners, I wanted to clarify and get your opinion on and um, give us a little bit of an education here, Hunter, is what is a neobank for those who may not be familiar? Um, simply put, it's a digital bank, so stays away from the brick and mortar and and a lot of kind of product type um, approach. So they'll they'll target a certain user base and try to make their life easier. They'll you know uh, help direct deposits faster. Like how do you address the need of your constituents rather than just chase a deposit base? All the while, that is all happening um, digitally. Got it. That that makes a lot of sense. And we see it all the time, right? The the decrease for overhead, the increase for the speed in terms of transactions and getting things faster. So um, I'm sure that's been, you know, profitable and, and potentially where things are going uh, in the future for, you know, banks in general. So thanks for that explanation. Um, so one of the strategies that you mentioned, obviously, is the different sectors and kind of those essential businesses um, kind of deemed by you is where you make your investment decisions. Um, but what other strategies potentially um, have driven your investment decisions to date? Um, and then maybe how have you adapted your approach to recent market changes? So the, the recent changes, I'll, you know, we, for instance, we the firm was very heavy into retail real estate up until a few years ago. And it's obviously very cliche to say Amazon is destroying retail now, but in 2014, 2015, I don't think it, it may or may not have been front page news at that point. And so kind of a reallocation within that cl asset class to now within real estate, uh, medical real estate. So again, like trying to find things that, theoretically still need to be in person for the foreseeable future. So a lot of vet services, um, dental services, ophthalmology, uh, we've been very active in, in both an operating business and, and a real estate function of acquiring those types of assets because again, you know, the the lens crafters may or may not be able to go online with with disruptors like Warby Parker, but that LASIK procedure, that actual surgery, you know, I, I don't see a drone flying in and, you know, chopping off a, 
a piece of your lens anytime soon. You know, not to yeah. say it can't happen. So the people out there, you know, uh, feel free to prove me wrong. But we're uh, from a real estate perspective, we feel pretty confident that those types of assets will will hold their value and um, be be very desirable. Especially as all of the capital out there is trying to find somewhere to go because now. You know they're they're not able to invest, and you know you're seeing a lot of consolidation of bank buildings, and a lot of 1031 buyers are now going to need to find a new asset, which which obviously Crexy is a great place not to you know plug, but it is, <laughs> uh, it is a great place for you know especially when there's a tax implication of needing to find something quickly. That is why these marketplaces like Crexy are, are so beneficial because there's so much velocity of of those types of transactions out there. Of course. And I I think that's an awesome way to pivot your strategy from, you know, more retail into, you know, medical office potentially and things like that. Uh, even though it breaks my heart that there's no more retail stores. I'm a very big in-person shopper. Or just smaller. Now. <laughs> or just smaller. <laughs> yeah. I order a lot of things online and then forget to return them. So that's on me for sure. But, um, you know, hopefully uh, they'll still be some things out there, but that's that's a great strategy, and you guys were able to to pivot quickly. So that's awesome to hear. Um, for for more of an individual purpose, so is there anything uh, that attracts you to particular founders or business ideas that you might want to invest in? That that is the that is probably the toughest part of all of this is finding good people, and we'll chase good people in a mediocre segment because that's really the, the hardest uh, equation these days. And, and it, every, probably everything I'll say is a bit cliche on it, but I, I do believe you know, things like authenticity. You know, if I can't trust the individual, you know, how am I? And our whole approach is to be more than just capital. We wanna be a swing member of the management team until we can help them scale and kind of work ourselves out of a job. So for me personally, it's really you know, kind of getting to know that person on a personal level. Are they authentic? I don't want them to tell me what they think I want to hear because yeah, I, like you're not gonna come up with a, you know, a new idea if you're not a little off the beaten path. So embrace your weirdness like it's completely you know it's a it's a good way to uh to build a business because you're going to have a lot of arrows thrown at you along the way from incumbents from you know naysayers from people who are jealous and you've just got to be able to tone it out and you know be very comfortable with who you are as an individual and so that that's probably one of the the main things I, I probe for in, in founders and individuals that we try to hire within our portfolio companies is, is that that kind of comfort in their own skin and what they're trying to do. And just sometimes it's got to be a bit delusional. You know, it sounds <laughs> strange, but, you know, if you aren't a little bit delusional, you're probably not uh, starting, you know, something, the next great startup. I love hearing that. Um, I, I I truly think, you know, a, a company is made by its people. Um, and one of my first mentors back when I was working in New York City um, and looking to potentially change jobs, they said, you know, there are three things that you should look for in a company. The first one's team. The second one is team. And the third one is product. So, you know, just kind of in that similar uh, line, you know, the the team really makes a company. So I I completely agree with you there. Thanks for sharing. The the team. And and I'll add just being okay with imperfection. You know, I, I forgot. I think it might be a Google quote, but the whole a better, you know, an imperfect, a shipped or a shipped product is better than a perfect product. And I ascribe that to you know, whatever you're doing, it's just sometimes you got to be comfortable with not having all the data points or it not being just mm-hmm. perfect. And you, because, you know, you might find out that imperfection might lead to some sort of new finding or new like that you weren't anticipating. Yeah, absolutely. I've, in in that same line, I've I've read quotes that you know if you're a founder and you're not you know embarrassed with your first iteration of your product, you know you didn't launch soon enough, right? So you yeah. know, kind of getting getting it out there and, and getting those crazy ideas um, 
out yeah, is, is, no, like, is important. <laughs> I like that one. That's a good way to put it. Absolutely. Um, so moving, moving, I, I know we kind of touched on this a little bit with, with the retail, but in a post COVID world, um, what trends do you see emerging in the CRE sector? So whether that's asset specific or just from a broader scale. So I'll take that in kind of two different, completely different directions. You know, if it's asset specific, you know, I think it's been interesting. I've been traveling recently and how busy, and I can speak for my own um, personality, like this wanderlust sense has returned of like, I want to go see things, I want to do things. So I think the experiential approach to a lot of the, like, how do you differentiate? You know, you mentioned wanting to go back to the store. I, I think, you know, just there's, you know, a long history of biology that certain things are going, we're, a, you know, very collaborative uh, species, if you will. And I think that those trends are, will come back. And in what way, you know, I'm not sure. Is it, you know, is it smaller experiences? Is it, you know, the concerts? I think you'll have different people chasing those, but I, I, I do think that you'll start to see a big um, draw towards, you know, spaces that can, you know, provide that, you know, that, that sense of, you know, community and, and, and interaction that we've all you know, had to uh, put on the back burner for the past year, year and a half or so. And so I think, you know, real estate or technologies that can improve that, that aspect are going to be um, very in vogue for the future. Um, I think as far as an asset class, you know, I think again, like housing uh, to go back to our thesis, it's just people i mean look at what's happened there's so many new buyers in the housing system like new home builds you know multifamily. those are all just i think it'll be if you can figure out the cost equation you know it's uh if there's ways to improve and that's excuse me supply chain it, it'll be hard to lose if you if you can um do it right but you know, execution is, is important in those because there's going to be a lot of people chasing those those asset classes. But, you know, I think it, it'll be interesting to see how far the pendulum tends to swing back and forth. And, you know, do we swing back to a, you know, pre-COVID level? I, I think not completely, but I think more than 50%. But I think the changes will be in efficiencies. People want, you know, more meaningful experiences, and so the like kind of the flippant trip is probably not coming back, but when you go, you want it to be really great. You want it to be a good experience and, and you, that will be you know, very important. And, and however you can help people make bit, better decisions on what that experience is like or you know, how um, to improve the interaction with people so that when you do, it's a very, you know, we're talking about getting something done, not just, a, you know, hey, I'm so-and-so from this place and the weather outside is 70 degrees. <laughs> and so I think that's where, that, you know, if I uh, had to say how things start to play out, I, I, that's the direction I think we'll, we'll in kind of maybe the um, status quo for the foreseeable future. Once we get through, you know, I, I think we're, we're not out of the woods yet. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and you kind of uh, alluded to this a little bit um, just with your comments at the end. So Hunter, how do you see maybe technology and companies like Crexy, you know, playing into those trends and, you know, kind of coming to um, a, a decision quicker or providing more value um, in, in kind of these meetups or transactions? I think it's the quality of the insight before you even get there. And, and so what Crexy does very well is provide a lot of insights in, ter in terms of opportunities, but also what's going on in that market. And, and so I think a lot of it is on the prep work that software and technology can, can help. But historically, you had to go to the area and drive around the market. You had to get a feel for it. And, and I don't know if you'll ever fully be able to replace that, but there's a bit of you know, if people aren't experiences, a lot of environments, do they have the heuristics to be able to say this is a good experience or a bad experience? Like, you know, that might bias decision making to be less effective because those interactions will be less. But that's where I think software and technology comes, 
plays is that you can be more um, you know, specific on what you're looking for, what's your criteria, because it is a very noisy world on all fronts. And so to the extent you can get better insights, I think that's really how you win in, in this environment because there's just so little room for error. It's like looking at sports 30 years ago, you know, Michael Jordan was just so far above, you know, everyone he was playing with. And now, you know, the best player and the, you know, the worst player, the band is just so tight. And I think that, you know, holds true in, in really all things at this point. Yeah, you're speaking to my heart, Hunter, with the Michael Jordan comments. <laughs> <laughs> Um, love, love that. But, you know, I absolutely agree. And if you guys haven't noticed by now, I love quotes. So knowledge is power is another one that I live by. Uh, so having all of that information and that insights prior, you know, is only going to help you. So I, I completely agree with that, with that sentiment, Hunter. Um, moving on, kind of one, uh, almost wrapping up here, but generally, what are some of your favorite lessons learned from investing, particularly in young companies? So I think, I think it's more around the challenges uh, rather than lessons. Like, A, there's going to be challenges. Everyone who thinks it's a rosy ride to the, uh, the unicorn or whatever you want to whatever is the, the new important milestone these days, it is fraught with challenges, both people, market, and everything in between. And the people you attract and you know, at the beginning aren't necessarily the people that towards the end help scale. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like there, we're all, it's really hard to have that range to go from zero to one and one to a hundred. There are different skill sets and that's okay. And, but it is, very important to be, you know, kind of going back to that brand concept at the beginning, to be very aware of, you know, that that exists and it's okay. And how do you help people transition it in and out when appropriate? That's probably the hardest skill set for a founder because there is a lot of loyalty and you've got to like we you got to think what's best for the person and best for the company. Um, and I think the mentality of like the company is a bit more like a team than a family is kind of a, a good way to kind of um, objectively look at it. And so, and there's nothing, again, there's just nothing wrong with that type of transition. And, and I think people are happier when they're um, in an environment that they're a better fit for. And so sometimes it's a, it's a favor to kind of redirect and, and get people in the places they enjoy being. And I think there's this shame that people think they need to go from zero to you know, the $10 billion company, and that's what everyone wants. And that's what the, you know, kind of the conventional wisdom says is the goal. But I, I take a bit of a contrarian approach to that. And it's like, you kind of bring in the right skill set at the right time. And sometimes those transgress and other times they don't. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with that type of, um, that situation. I think people need to embrace it more. And in this environment, it's, it's really easy to find a job. So <laughs> and again, when you're thinking about your cross paths with people over 10, 15, 20 years, you know, they might develop the new idea at the next startup that's going to be life-changing for us all. And, you know, helping people find those callings is, is really impactful and, you know, really rewarding um, when, you, when you kind of take a step back from what, what you think you need for the company and what's best for kind of everyone involved. Absolutely. I loved both of your points there, Hunter. So first to say, you know, success is not linear, right? There's a bunch of up and downs. And I think second about the team, I, I completely agree with that. And I think it's important to have the self-awareness, right? To say, I did this and I was able to get the company from X to Y, but from Y to Z just needs to be someone that maybe has done this before, or has other things that I don't have. And I really think when you start thinking about a company like a team, you know, team members do what they can for each other. They step up when they can and they let someone else take over, you know, if, if that's what's the best and what's going to, you know, win so to speak yeah so, and, I, and i think there's no shame and you know in those transitions and, and i think they should actually be like applauded more because it's a much harder move to do that for both people um mm -hmm. so when i see these kind of moves in the market where people are just like you know i've enjoyed my run and i'm ready for the next challenge like if you're if you're not 
fully committed, like in, in all your being, it's it's really hard to to be in a startup or in a high growth company because it is very consuming and, and like physically and mentally. And so, you know, it's doing yourself, um, you know, uh, a benefit to, to take a step back and think, is this where, is this where I'm happiest most? Because generally you're going to be producing better for a company, better for yourself when you can match, you know, the, if it's that it's product market fit, but for the individual, uh, and I think <laughs> not enough people, um, you know, are pre, like kind of take that into consideration and they view it as a failure when they've kind of fallen out of it. And, and I just, you know, for, for younger founders, I, I just think that that's what something I see over and over again in these high growth companies that there's this sentiment of failing the individual when it's, it's not that way. And, and it really should be viewed as a, you know, an opportunity and, and to find that right fit and that right you know, trajectory for everyone involved. Absolutely. And I, I agree on that, that failure aspect, you know, at least you did something that so many other people can't do, whether or not you take it to fruition or, or, you know, kind of exit at certain points, but definitely kind of be proud of that. And then just again, product market fit for yourself. I think that's a, that's a good way to think about it. Perfect. Um, so then our final kind of topic for our listeners here, Hunter, uh, what advice would you give uh, your fellow investors? So whether in the VC or commercial real estate space? That's a great question. Um, so at the risk of, of sounding just like a recording, you know, I, I think everyone's got to find what they're good at and what you know, not don't just invest in something because everyone else is because that, you know, my my biggest mistakes have been that or um, kind of just trusting someone else's diligence and, you know, kind of just piling on to the, the quote unquote herd mentality or, you know, hiring someone because I had a need and not because they were the right person. And so if you can avoid those two things, I think you're in pretty good shape regardless of, of what you do, and except, except maybe, you know, build a new newspaper business, the um, <laughs> paper version. But outside of that, uh, you know, I think it's more philosophical than it is specific. I like that, you know, make your own choices, do something that you personally connect with versus what the masses are doing. Um, and kind of similar, bringing it full circle back to when we were discussing Crexy with, you know, hiring the personnel, hire the good person, right? Hire the person that is authentic that you discussed before. And, and maybe you need to wait, right? Um, you know, but good, good things will come to those that wait. So I like kind of both of both of your sides of that coin there. So thanks. Of course. And then one, one of our last questions um, is any advice for new founders seeking to start their own business? Do it. Why not? <laughs> you, you'll, you, people don't really regret, regret taking the brave choice. I think it's, you know, uh, if it doesn't work, you know, you can, you can go take that salary job or, you know, take another stab and you'll have something unique on your resume that probably advances you in that other role. But yeah, I think people look back and say, I wish I would have tried, you know, I, again, there's different limiting, you know, personal reasons of why maybe you can or can, but, you know, it doesn't hurt it, or even do it on the weekends. I mean, there's, there's plenty of time. Absolutely. And with this day and age, I feel like everyone has a side hustle. <laughs> so, you know, start it on the weekends or do it. You know, you always regret more of what you didn't do than what you did do. You'll learn a lot um, in that in that short amount of time, I'm sure. So appreciate the encouragement for all of our potential new business owners uh, who are listening. So thanks so much, Hunter, for joining us and sharing your insights, especially on such important topics. We truly appreciate your time today. I know you're very busy. So thanks for taking the time to sit down with us. Of course. So before you go, um, if any of our followers want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Maybe an email or social media? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest. <laughs> yep. I'm a bad social media person, but that one I 
I track or keep, uh, you know, check. Perfect. So for all our fans, it is Hunter Dallas, Leon Capital on his LinkedIn. Um, so please definitely connect with him, check him out. Um, and thank you again, Hunter, so much for your time. Thanks, Ashley. Appreciate it. Of course. Thanks everyone who tuned in today. If you enjoyed this episode, do not miss the next one. Visit go.crexi, that's C-R-E-X-I dot com backslash podcast and sign up to get the next episode delivered straight to your inbox. Of course, you can always subscribe to the Crexi podcast on your favorite podcast app and check out our YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Take care and be sure to tune in next time. Thank you.